Well, good morning. I am glad that you are all here today. Are you glad to worship today? Ron, it is so good to see you here today. Way to go. Proud of you. <laughs> if you would stand, um, I want to read. We, if you've noticed, we've been reading in Colossians a lot. And I want to continue in Colossians. This is chapter 2, starting in verse 6. And now, just as you accepted Christ Jesus as your Lord, you must continue to live in obedience to him. Let your roots go down deep in him and draw up nourishment from him so that you will grow in faith, strong and vigorous in the truth you were taught. Let your lives overflow with thanksgiving for all he has done. Don't let anyone lead you astray with empty philosophy and high-sounding nonsense that comes from human thinking and the evil powers of this world and not from Christ. For in Christ, the fullness of God lives in a human body, and you are complete through your union with Christ. He is the Lord over every ruler and authority in the universe. When you came to Christ, you were circumcised, but not by a physical procedure. It was a spiritual procedure, the cutting away of your sinful nature. For you were buried with Christ when you were baptized, and with him you were raised to new life because you trusted the mighty power of God who raised Christ from the dead. You were dead because of your sins and because of your sinful nature was not yet cut away. Then God made you alive with Christ. He forgave all your sins. He canceled the record that contained the charges against us and took it and destroyed it by nailing it to Christ's cross. In this way, God disarmed the evil rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross of Christ. Amen? Well, let's sing about the victory that we have in Jesus. Amen? I heard an old, old story How a Savior came from glory How he gave his life on Calvary to save a wretch like me. I heard about his groaning, of his precious blood's atoning. Then I repented of my sins and won the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is due him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. I heard about his healing, of his cleansing power revealing. How he made the lame to walk again and caused the blind to see. And then I cried, dear Jesus, come and heal my broken spirit. And somehow Jesus came and brought to me the victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. has built for me in glory and i heard about the streets of gold beyond the crystal sea about the angels singing and the old redemption story and some sweet day i'll sing up there 
the song of victory. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. He loved me ere I knew him, and all my love is to him. He plunged me to victory beneath the cleansing flood. Why don't you turn and greet one another in the name of the Lord and tell him about the victory you have in Jesus. Well, good morning. Boy, that was weak. Let's try it again. Good morning. Hey, there you woke up. It just took a second. Just took a second. I understand that. It is great to see you this morning. Hope you're having a wonderful day and uh, that your morning started off bright and early and right and everything is good. I'm excited about today. I think we have some great things in store today. And uh, we're going to celebrate a lot of fun stuff. I'm going to have Beth come and share an announcement. I'm talking about, is this working? Yep, you're on. Okay, I'm talking about children's quizzing. That's coming up again quicker than we ever thought. We're going to be doing the book of Genesis this year. And we're starting two weeks from today on August the 11th for our regular quiz practice. Here at the church, 145. This is for kids uh, grades one through six, and we would like to have, we have our ones coming back from last year, we'd like to have some new ones. So if you have some friends that would like to come, please invite them. And to kick it off, next week on the fourth, week from today on Sunday, 
we're going to be having a pool party and information day about quizzing. And that's going to be held at Steve and Glenda Thummel's house. They have a pool there. There's Glenda there. And that's on Albert Street. And um, I will just give you the information if you don't know it. I sent out a little text last night to those who I had on my uh, phone list from last year. And the pool party is going to be at 5 o'clock. So it's at 4 o'clock. But it's already out of date. So we're going to do 5 o'clock. <laughs> so anyway, um, things change. I want to make sure we got our Hispanic kids in. So that was why we had to change. It's going to be 4 o'clock somewhere, 5 o'clock <laughs> somewhere. And if you show up, I'm sure there'll be a pool and a party. How about that? We'll make that, that work. A couple other quick announcements, and then John's going to come and share one, and then we have a little special thing to do today. Uh, next Sunday is a huge Sunday for our church. We're going to be having some very special missionaries in um, who are coming to us from one of our... Um, areas in the, in the world that we can't tell you where they're from. Uh, they will tell you uh, it, where they're from, and uh, it'll be a great time of, of learning about missions in a place where it is illegal to be a Christian. It is illegal to share your faith. It is illegal to uh, be all about Jesus, and they're going to share how they do that with a family of four. They have two young boys. And it's just going to be a great service. Following that next Sunday after Sunday school, we're going to have a carry-in dinner. We have not done a carry-in dinner for like ever. And we're going to do an old-fashioned carry-in dinner next Sunday uh, after service and Sunday school so that you have an opportunity to spend a little more time with our missionaries. So plan on doing that, bringing in food items to share. It'll be a great day. And uh, we're looking forward to that. In anticipation of that, uh, Friday afternoon, starting at noon through Saturday noon, we're going to be having a prayer vigil here at the church. This will be our third prayer vigil that we've done. We're trying to do uh, one every other month or one every quarter at least. And uh, the sign-up sheet for that is out here in this foyer, and we'd encourage you to sign up to be a part of uh, that time of corporate prayer together, individual prayer. We'll have stations around the church to be praying for specific things going to be talking about that a little bit tonight and some of the questions uh, that I believe we need to ask in preparation for a time of corporate prayer. So I encourage you to take time to uh, sign up and then if you can be here tonight, come and share uh, in a special service uh, with us. Uh, this week is teen camp, junior high camp, and they'll be headed off tomorrow. Uh, we want to be remembering them. And then my wife told me that I have to remember to announce that if you have pieces of fleece um, material one yard in length, uh, they are needing that for a special project they're going to be doing in conjunction with our uh, Women of the Well, a place to belong uh, Saturday in September. And if you have those, if you could see, uh, who all can they see? They can see Don Marie, they can see Debbie, they can see um, Cindy, they can see... I think Glenda's a part of that group. Whoever, if they look like they'd be a part of a one at the well thing, just walk up and say, I have fleece for you. And uh, they would love to have that. John's going to come and share. And, uh, oh, I got one more thing I have to do first. If you have not yet had an opportunity to sign up for our new communication process, uh, we have some guys walking around. Just raise your hand. Uh, they'd be glad to give you an envelope. The cost is $5 a year. We hate to have to charge for that, but it's the, the best system we've found yet to make it happen, to communicate and make sure that you actually get uh, the information we're sending between all of the Internet providers out there, especially the email providers who have decided that they're going to take on spam mail. Uh, about half the stuff we send out never gets delivered, and it gets... They get kind of arbitrary with their who's not going to get it. You'll get it this time and not next time, and it's just weird. So we have found a system that guarantees delivery for us, and it's a way for us to communicate. So if you've not had a chance, we just need one name per envelope, uh, one phone number, and then make certain that you circle how you would like to receive information, and uh, we'll make sure that we get you that information. Pastor John, come share, and then we have something special to do. Well, you've noticed that we said August 11th we were doing Pilgrim's Progress. There's been a slight change. Um, I'm going to just leave that right there. 
we, uh, we're going to show a different movie on August the 11th. Um, have you seen the movie Breakthrough or heard of the movie Breakthrough? Some of you have. Um, well, they are allowing that free for churches. We don't have to do the copyright license uh, if we do it in the month of August. So we are going to show the movie Breakthrough here, um, hopefully on August the 11th. Um, and uh, then in September, as soon as the Spanish version of Pilgrim's Progress is available, we will show it here, and we will do an English and a Hispanic, a Hispanic, a Spanish version, yes, simultaneously, okay? So you can choose which one you want to watch. So that will be in September. No, not the same room at the same time. Two different places in our building. So um, got a couple of movies coming for you, August 11th and then in September. It would be kind of fun to do them in the same room at the yeah, same time. Yeah. I don't know if we can do that. Hey, that'd be good. Well, hey, you know, every once in a while, um, God allows us to have somebody really, really, really special in our midst. And um, we had somebody in our church family this summer who has accomplished something that a lot of people only dream of. And I'm going to have Bailey Boyer come up and see me. Come on up here, girl. And you're like a little shorter than these are, so I'm going to lower these. <laughs> Sorry, I had to do that. <laughs> calling you up, calling you out. It works really well. I'm going to let John do a little bit of an interview after. Yeah, you're going to talk to her about what all she had to do, but I'm going to share a little information about her first. Okay. Why she is so special. Uh, Bailey is a gymnast. And if you've ever been outside before or after church and you see this thing go twirling and whirling and flipping and flapping away, you would probably be able to say, that's that, there goes Bailey. And that's just the way she is. I kind of had a vision this morning of you doing like flips all the way down and right up onto the platform. Is that a possibility? No. <laughs> We were just kind of like thinking how we could make this really cool. But this summer, uh, Bailey had an opportunity to compete in the 2019 AAU Nationals for Gymnastics. And uh, they made a trip to Florida. And um, I don't know what all of these numbers mean, but in her division, which is L3C9G5, it took me an hour to find all this information out. <laughs> She scored a 9.325 on vault, a 9.125 on the bars, a 9.550 on the beam, a 9.500 on the floor for a combined total of 37.500, which garnered her third place in the nationals. Now, now that's huge, but let me read what else she has done to get there. Uh, she won first in the all-around at 7 out of 10 meets, second all-around at 2 out of 10, and third in the all-around in 1 out of 10. So at least top three in every meet she competed in. She's received 21 gold medals, 7 silver medals, 4 bronze medals, um, at the Nationals, those numbers, she placed second on the vault and floor, fourth on the beam, sixth on the bars, third all around, and she just did amazing. And we just thought you all needed to see somebody who's like a hero <laughs> because she's one of us. Isn't that cool? Now, John, you get to ask her questions what it was like and where they went and all that good stuff. Okay, so I, I wasn't knew that I didn't know that I was going to do this. So, how did you how did you get there? What did what did it take besides winning all these events? How long did how long was this process? Hey John, take, take your Thank you. I'm I'm interviewing her. You can go sit down. <laughs> <laughs> how how long of the process was it? Like, did you start this summer or last summer? I started, okay, I'm a second, I was a second year level three, and so I've already been a level three, and I didn't do so well last season, so I worked hard to win this season, like it was commitment. That, oh, did you hear that? She worked hard and commitment. That sounds really cool. So, and it was, how long is your season? Like, when did you start? We start in like August, and then we end in June. 
Okay, so almost a full year. Yeah. Wow. Wow. Where was the where was the state meet held? Um, here in, in Salina. Salina. Yeah. Cool. And how long did you have between the state meet and the fi and the national meet? About two or three months. Two or three months. Yeah. Cool. Anything that you would like to know from Bailey? This is why she would always say on Wednesday night, "I've got gymnastics. I can't come to youth group." <laughs> um, in level three, I practice from. 5.30 to about 8. In the evening, right? Yeah. How many days? How many days? Three days a week. And that doesn't count the, all the times that she's hanging around the church doing the... <laughs> <laughs> Those are just fun things. <laughs> I started when I was like 8, and I'm 12 now. All right. And What's your favorite? Um, That's it. I like beam and floor. A lot. <laughs> <laughs> I can answer that question. There were over 400 names I went through in like two point print to find Bailey. <laughs> if I'd have known to go to your level, it would have been a whole lot easier. <laughs> I don't think I'm going to make it to the Olympics, but I would like to do college gymnastics. Cool. All right. Well, thank you, Bailey. And we've been planning to do this for several times, and Ron just keeps going to the hospital. So, <laughs> so we are glad that Ron is able to come today because Bailey did not want to do this without Ron being here, right? Yeah. yeah. All right. And we want you to know we're really proud of you. Congratulations. Did <laughs> you do a flip? <laughs> Uh-oh, here oh. she goes. She's going to have fun. Huh? I, you have a watch. Here she goes. Uh -oh. <laughs> there you go. Hey, Bailey. If you'll go call the ambulance, I'll try one of those. Okay? Okay. We'll get her done. Give it up one more time for Bailey. Love you, girl. Love you too. I, was, uh, I didn't realize that this was her second attempt at it, but wow. That speaks volumes when she said, I decided I wanted to do better, so I spent time and commitment um, John, there's a sermon in that. I, I think there's a sermon in that if you wanted to. Yeah, yeah wow. Um, how many of you guys would have that commitment? You don't have to raise your hand. But uh, have you ever not succeeded in life and said, you know, I can do better and went back and, and tried? Um, wow, thanks, Bailey, for sharing that. Why don't you stand and we will continue on. talking about all the joys of the Christian life are found in Christ. We can try to do things on our own. It doesn't usually seem to work out very well. If we'll go with God, things will happen much better. Oh, oh, oh. Our hearts now 
unto yours. Every fear bow down to your love that we would see like never before. Give us a greater glimpse of a never-changing God. Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you. Jesus, every victory is found in you, found in you. Oh, 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 oh. And in your presence there is freedom. And in your presence we are made whole. Till all we want and all we need is found in you, found in you. Jesus, every victory is found in you. God delights in the praises of his people. Do you believe that? Do you practice that? Practice praise, saying, God, thank you for all that you do in my life. Now, I, I want to start and just kind of walk through the sanctuary this morning and praise the Lord. Last Sunday, while we were in worship, Derek McKellips was uh, having a heart cath done. He, uh, he had three blockages they were able to get opened up. Uh, I saw him during Sunday school, and he was uh, fixing to eat lunch. And was excited about life. He, he had a little problem. They did it through the, the, the I, I don't know if it's a radial artery or what here in his, his right arm. And, and you're supposed to keep it still. But he's kind of like my daughter and he's animated when he talks. And he likes to use his arm. And the nurse kept coming in saying, hold that still, hold that still. But you know, it was so exciting to go in and realize that God heard and answered prayer. And we give him praise for that this morning. Amen. Amen. Ron Boyer, man, it is just amazing to see how God's been at work in your life. It is a miracle. It really is. And I am so glad you're here this morning. And, uh, you know, a few weeks ago, I was with Ron in, in ICU. And Ron looked at me and he said, those little girls are the most important thing in my life. So girls, I want to look you in the eye. I got to get here where I can look you both in the eye. You're heroes to grandpa, okay? So you make him be good, okay? <laughs> you make him be good. But Ron, it is so good to see you this morning, and we just praise the Lord for what, you're, what, what God's doing in your life and, and thankful for that. Then I gotta go this way, and I gotta look up this aisle right here, and I see Joe Cobb. Joe decided this week that he was going to um, see if he, you know that old phrase, weebles wobble, but they don't fall down? Sometimes they do, and, and Joe wound up having to have a bunch of stitches put in, and, uh, but he is kicking this morning and doing great, and Joe, it is great to see you this morning, and we just thank the Lord again for his touch in your life. God is doing so many amazing things in the hearts and lives of our people, and I just want to praise him for that this morning. I think too often we come to the Lord in prayer and it's like, woe is me. I've got this problem and that problem and this going on and that going on. 
And I think God at times says, you know, have you noticed that I still work in your life? Don't just complain about what's wrong. So this morning we're going to do something a little different in prayer time. We're just going to praise him. Now there's one big need I want to share. Edna Heist uh, is not with us this morning. She is now on hospice care. And we want to be praying for Edna and the girls that the Lord would just be with them. But you know, even in the midst of that, there's praise. Because God is providing in amazing ways. Uh, this week, Dwight Downing survived another camp. <laughs> Hallelujah. And um, he had a wonderful time, as did our kids. We've got another camp going on this week. God's just doing some amazing things. And so what we're going to do this morning is kind of change things up as we prepare our hearts in, in, to go to the Lord in prayer. What I'd like for you to do is begin thinking about something very specific you can praise the Lord for. I, I don't want you to lift a need this morning. I want you to lift a voice of praise. And when we come to prayer time this morning, you'll have an opportunity to do that out loud. And we're going to celebrate what Jesus is doing in our midst. Amen? Amen. Amen. Yeah. 
is of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. I'm running to your arms. I'm running to your arms. The riches of your love will always be enough. Nothing compares to your embrace. Light of the world forever reign. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. My heart will sing no other name, Jesus, Jesus. Father God, we hear your word where David says, praise the Lord. Praise God in the sanctuary. Praise him in his mighty heavens. Praise him for his mighty deeds. Praise him according to his excellent greatness. Praise him with trumpet sound. Praise him with lute and harp. Praise him with tambourine and dance. Praise him with strings and pipe. Praise him with sounding cymbals. Praise him with loud clashing cymbals. Let everything that has breath praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. And Lord God, this morning as we bow in your presence, our sole desire is to take time to do that, to say thank you, God, for the way you continually provide for each of us, for the way you pour out your love upon us, how when we run to your arms, we're met with that glad embrace, how when in weakness you give us strength, how in times of difficulty, you are the peace that passes understanding. We just want to pause to give you praise this morning. And corporately, we do that now and ask God you would hear the praises of your people as we offer them to you today in the name of Jesus.
Father God, you are so good. And we just praise you. And even as we think for a moment about our needs, Lord, we recognize that even in those we can praise you today. Because your word says that you know our needs before we speak them. We can praise you for that. Because you know them, we know that you're already at work in the midst of them. And the promise of your holy word is that your grace will be sufficient. For that, we give you praise. We give you praise, Lord, for your provisions in our lives. For the jobs that we've been blessed to have, for the way that you have provided through them. And for those who are blessed to live in the retirement years, for the way that God, you provided and continue to provide. And Lord, we're just so thankful that you see our needs and you promise to meet them. And that's a reality in all of our lives, Lord, and we say thank you. We want to do that tangibly as we worship and return to you our tithes and our offerings of love. And as we do that, I pray, God, that they would be a tangible means of saying thank you and of praising you. Because, God, we take nothing for granted that you do for us every moment of every day. May we today be a people who praise the Lord. Yes, I say it again, praise the Lord. In Christ's name, amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in And when I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I will never be the Lord was another in the fire standing next to me there was another in the waters holding back the seas and should I ever need reminding of how I've been set free there is a cross that bears the burden where another died for me there is another in All my debt left for dead beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I won't bow to the things of this world. And I know I will never be alone. There is another in the fire standing next to me. There is another in And should I ever need reminding What power sets me free There is a brain that holds the body Now that power lives in me There is another in the fire
the heavens There's the space between where still I can feel the ground Shake beneath us As the prison walls gave in Nothing stands between us Nothing stands between us There is no other name but the name that is Jesus He who was and still is and will be through it all Come what may in this space between all the things that seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters holding back. And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me I'll count the joys come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be And I can see the light In the darkness As the darkness bows to him I can hear the roar In the heavens as the space between where's thin, I can feel the ground shake beneath us. As the prison walls cave in, nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between. There'll be another in the fire, standing next to me. There'll be another in the waters, holding back the seas. And should I ever need reminding How good you've been to me How come the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be How come the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be How come the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be We serve an awesome God, amen? amen. It is great this morning to be able to celebrate his word with you. Get all my electronics going here. Over the last couple of weeks, I've been sharing with you a part of our vision that God has called us into vital relationship with him and has called us to lead others into vital relationship with him. Uh, and this morning, I want to wrap up this series of messages by sharing with you something the Lord has just been speaking into my heart in recent days that um, I think is an incredible part of this story an incredible part of what God wants to speak to us. If you have a Bible this morning and you want to follow along, it'll be on the screen as well, but this morning I want us to turn to Matthew chapter 10, and we're going to look at verses 16 through 20. I'm reading this morning from the uh, English Standard Version, and, and this is the word of the Lord. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves, so be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they will deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues, and you'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. And when they deliver you over, do not be anxious 
how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. Now, before we get going this morning, I want to say to you very quickly that the context of this passage is very, very specific to the day in which Jesus was ministering. He's communicating a word to a people who are becoming very used to something that, that we call persecution. As they would begin to share, there were oftentimes those in the religious sects of the day that would grab hold of them and they would cast them into a courtroom setting and they would flog them and they would imprison them and they would persecute them simply because they named the name of Jesus. That's very, very foreign to us. We don't understand that. We live in a place where you can talk about Jesus just about anywhere and get away with it. Oh, there may be some, you know, comments made here and there, and people may suggest that you not say what you're saying, and, and they may make some, you know, offhanded remarks and do things that would make you feel uncomfortable about continuing, but the bottom line is this. We live in a day where we don't have a clue what Jesus is talking about by and large. But within this passage of scripture, there are some very significant truths that I think are very important for us to look at in light of what I've shared the last couple of weeks. Uh, two weeks ago, I challenged you with me, actually three weeks ago, I challenged you with me uh, in Philippians chapter three to understand what it is when Paul says, I want to know Christ. He wasn't talking about some head knowledge or some way of trying to understand things from a, a, a heady intellectual way. He was talking about this vital relationship where with everything in him, he desired to know Jesus and, and to come into a personal relationship with him that was vibrant and active and present in his everyday life. I, I loved what Gail said in his praise this morning during prayer time when he said, I am so glad that God, you are as present today as you were in the days of the Bible. I don't know if you heard that, but my heart just resounded with that because that's what Paul's talking about. I want to know Christ. I, I want to live in this vibrant relationship where I see God at work in my life every moment of every day in the situations and the circumstances that I find myself in. And we went from that part of the journey to last week talking about the Great Commission and those four simple words that Jesus gave us that define our existence and the reason why we're here. We're called to go, we're called to make, we're called to disciple and we're are baptized and we're called to teach. Go, make, baptize, teach. Pretty easy to remember that little statement that here's why I exist. Well, this morning I want to take it one step further because though only one person said it, I, I think it's important for all of us to hear it. Somebody said last week, you don't know how hard that is for me. I mean, really, think about it. I've not been trained theologically. I've not been trained to do all the stuff that you call, you know, going to share the good news. I don't know how to deal with people. And what happens if they answer, ask questions that I, I don't know how to answer? What am I going to say? What am I going to do? Well, I'm going to help you with that this morning. But before we do that, there are some misconceptions that I think we need to take a look at just by way of introduction. These, these come from a guy by the name of <clears throat> Trey Gilmore who's writing in an online uh, magazine called Relevant, which is, uh, for about the last 20 years, has been one of the most powerful online uh, magazines addressing the spiritual life and spiritual needs of 20-somethings and 30-somethings. Now, I'm a ways beyond that, but I like to think I'm younger than I am, so I, I read that stuff every once in a while just to try to stay relevant. And it's interesting that what Gilmore says is something I think we need to, to pay attention. The first misconception he talks about is the goal is just to get people to heaven. Now that's an absolute misconception. Because when it comes to sharing our faith, the goal is not a destination, it's a journey. 
God calls you and I to lead people into a vital relationship that ultimately, yes, it will bring them to a place of glory in heaven, but there's a whole lot of time, hopefully, between when I come to know Christ and when I finally get there. And that journey is what is so vitally important and so incredibly significant that we grab hold of. So it's an absolute misconception. My goal should not be just to get people to accept Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. My goal should be to invite them to engage in a relationship that's ongoing and active and filled with joy on the journey. I remember my youth pastor, Steve Brown, when he led me to the Lord back in, in, in 1999. That was a long time ago. Um, I'll soon be a 40-year-old Christian. Um, first week in September. And... Um, the one thing he said to me was, John, don't think this is fire insurance. My goal is not just to keep you out of hell. My goal is to give you a better life. And that's what we have to focus on. There's a second misconception, and that is that we have to defend Jesus. Now, I... I, I <laughs> At the risk of sounding um, less than I want to sound, I'm just going to say this. I don't think anyone here is able to defend Jesus. I mean, he's God. And I don't think God needs to be defended. He's the one who, with a single swipe of his hand, put all the stars in the sky and set the orbits in motion. He's the one with his voice who said, in the beginning, God let us make. He's the one who has spoken everything into being. I don't think I need to defend that. But too often when it comes to sharing our faith, we think that that's part of the journey. I have to find a way to make him seem believable. Let me let you in on a secret. Jesus can stand on his own two feet. He can. And the danger of thinking that you and I have to defend our faith in order to lead someone into a personal relationship with him only sets us up for arguments. Because the reality is the minute we start to defend, we start to express opinion. And everybody has one and few of them agree. So we don't have to defend Jesus. There's a, there's a third misconception that I think we need to understand, and that is that beliefs matter more than experiences. <clears throat> there are those who think that until you understand all the finer points of all the theological doctrines and all of the intricacies of statements of faith, they think that unless you get all of that and understand it completely with your Thompson Chain Reference Bible in hand to proof text everything you've believed, that there's absolutely no way you'll ever get people to believe. I think that's hogwash. I think of Jesus meeting the woman at the well who, who begins to talk to her about her life and points out that, well, she, she seems to have gone through a lot of husbands, the Zaza Gabor of Bible days, you know? And, 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 and she gets to the place where it's like, wow, you, you, you know a lot about me. And, and she has this incredible experience and she goes back to town and she makes this statement, come see a man who told me everything about me. And, and they come out and, and then someone looks at Jesus and says, you know, we've heard, but now we come to see. And, and he points out this incredible truth that experiences, personal experiences with Jesus often become the foundation for what we believe, not the other way around. Well, there, there's another misconception that, that's rather interesting. Uh, someone must believe before we can invite them into community. H have you ever noticed that we want people to act like us, dress like us, talk like us, think like us, feel like this, worship like us, uh, before we ever think they can be one of us? Now, I know what you're thinking. Not me. 
I've tried to break into churches, not physically, but break into the, the fellowship of churches. <laughs> I have broken into a few churches when I forgot my keys, but, but we'll not go there. Um, but there's this misconception that until somebody has it all figured out, they can't belong. May I suggest that the best place to figure it out is with those who are living to try to figure it out? And we ought not worry about whether or not they get it all right. We ought to celebrate the fact that they're willing to come in and risk hanging out with people who might be just a little bit further down the road than they are. There's a, another misconception. We have to simplify the gospel. I don't believe that God wants us to dumb it down. I, I just don't believe that. Now, we're masters at it, preachers especially. We got three point outlines and four point outlines and four steps to this and four steps to that and three steps to this and we got the four spiritual laws and we got the Romans road to salvation and we have to have all these things to simplify what absolutely is beyond our ability to conceive. His ways are higher than our ways. How can we say we're going to figure that out? What God seems to want us to understand is he's going to give us what we need when we need it and that's good enough. I don't have to have it all. I don't have to simplify it. I don't have to make it something that everybody can grab hold of. I just have to say, let me share with you my friend Jesus and let Jesus do the work in you that he desires to do. You know, all of those misconceptions really sound great, but they are dead wrong. They're just dead wrong. They're not what this thing of going and making and baptizing and teaching is really supposed to be all about. So listen to the word again this morning that I shared earlier. Behold, I'm sending you out as sheep in the midst of wolves. So be wise as serpents and innocent as doves. Beware of men, for they'll deliver you over to courts and flog you in their synagogues. You'll be dragged before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them and the Gentiles. When they deliver you over, catch this, do not be anxious how you are to speak or what you are to say, for what you are to say will be given you in that hour. For it is not you who speak, but the spirit of your father speaking through you. What incredible truth. That I don't have to know it all, figure it all out, have it rehearsed and ready to just recite. I don't have to do that. Because every time I enter into a conversation with an individual person with individual needs and set circumstances that are going on in their world, God the Holy Spirit gives me what I need to say that's particularized for that moment. And it works. Because we're not the ones who save people, he is. Amen. So let me share with you quickly this morning a couple of truths that I think are significant that we can learn from this passage. First of all, we are sent. Behold, I am sending you out as sheep among the wolves. That doesn't sound really nice. I just got to be honest. But the very fact that God has chosen to send you and I into a world that can be at times very contrary is good news. Because don't you think if he sends us, he can take care of us when we're there? Now, now that word send is an interesting word. It comes from the Greek word apostoleo, and it, it means literally to be sent to an appointed place. It, it's the word that we use, that we translate apostles in the New Testament. It's the word that we use to describe the disciples, Paul, all of those folks who go from place to place to place sharing the good news. Guess what? You and I are one of them. Isn't that interesting? That it's not just the seminary trained, it's not just the Bible school trained, it's, it's not just the people who've gone through all of the requirements to get to the place where they finally get ordained. It's not just those folks who are being sent, but it's every single one of us who is being sent to share the good news of the gospel. As followers of Christ, living in relationship with him, he has chosen us to share the good news. That's you. That's me. That's we. 
We have been sent to share the good news. Now, now it's interesting when you begin to look at scripture and how that all plays out, there are some fascinating words. Romans uh, chapter 10, uh, verses 13 through 15, for everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. So that's an incredible truth. If you ask Jesus to come into your life to forgive you of your sins, he says, I will do that. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. It's a done deal. He's made it possible through the cross. But notice this. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? And how are they to believe in him of whom they've never heard? And how are they to hear without someone preaching to them? And how are they to preach unless they're sent? As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Now, now I know what you're going to do. You're going to get hung up on that word preach. And you're going to say, Pastor, you just identified your job, not mine. Um, don't take this wrong, but you're wrong. One who preaches is one who tells the story of Jesus. Do you tell the story of Jesus? That's preaching. It's sharing. Now, now it's kind of interesting how Paul wants us to make sure we get that. He wants us to understand that, that how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. And, and here's what he says. Therefore... If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. I like that. Who I was is not who I am. God changed me. Hallelujah. That is good news. Trust me, you would not want as your pastor the guy that I was when Jesus find me. You, you wouldn't want that. You, I guarantee you wouldn't want that. I wouldn't want that. But notice then what he says. He said, all of this grace is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their sins against them, entrusting to us the message of reconciliation. Now get this, therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. We implore you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God. Now, 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 now catch with me just for a moment what that says. In Romans, how beautiful are the feet of those who bring the good news. In 2 Corinthians, you are an ambassador for Christ. You have beautiful feet. You may not have thought that, but you do. Because the moment you step forward and you share the story of Jesus with anybody, you are blessed of God and you are representing him with all of the rights and the power and the authority that he has given you as the son of God. I love that thought. I'm an ambassador for Christ. I go with his power. I go with his blessing. I go with his authority. Every place I go, I go with the stamp of Jesus upon my life so that when I see people, when I meet people, when I share with people, they understand this isn't coming from John. This is coming from his king, King Jesus. That's the truth that lies behind we are sent. But then notice this truth. When we're sent, we will be met or we will meet with difficulty. I am sending you out as sheep among the wolves. That word wolves is an interesting word. In the Greek language, it's the word lukos. It, it, it speaks of one who is cruel, rapacious, or wolfish. I, I love that word. How did you know? You're so good. <laughs> It's a bad blood sugar day. Sorry, folks. It's an incredible thought that what you and I are going to what you and I are going to face at times is somebody who will respond cruelly or wolfishly. Or destructive. 
My last church, I had a family who lived 65 miles south of town and drove in for church and they raised wolves, purebred wolves. Had a license from the federal government to do so and there was this rule if you went down to see them, you could drive onto their property, you could pull up to the parking pad at the front door, but you better make doggone sure your windows were up and your doors were locked and your horn worked because you just laid on the horn and waited for someone to come out and put the wolves away. Now, I don't know if you've ever seen an Alaskan timber wolf. They weigh about 150, 160 pounds. They stand about this tall on me. They're bigger than a Great Dane. Their teeth are about that long. <laughs> and when they smile, they make you just shudder, scare you to death. Every time I read this passage of scripture, I see one of those stupid wolves. Belinda was this tiny little gal. She was a, not much bigger than Bailey, this mama. And, and she would go out and she would throw those wolves on the ground and wrestle with them. And it's like, you are a psycho woman. But to her, they were no big deal. Because those wolves knew who the boss was. And I want you to understand this morning that when you go as an ambassador for Christ, the world that you go into sooner or later will recognize the authority that you have. And they'll just quit arguing. They'll, they'll finally get to the place where they figure out that you mean them good, not evil that your heart is for something better for them, not what they're living right now. But you have to get there to understand it. Not everyone you're gonna to talk to is gonna be kind. Not everyone you talk to is gonna be receptive. Not everyone you talk to is gonna say, tell me more. Some are going to tell you in very emphatic terms, I wanna hear less, get out of my face. Doesn't mean we stop going. It just means we understand who we're doing battle with. I love the way Jesus addressed those difficulties. John chapter 16, verse 33, he said, in this world, you will have tribulation, you'll have trouble, but I want you to take heart because I've overcome the world. Those contrary, difficult people who just tell you to hush and be quiet and, and all those other things, Jesus has already overcome them. They just haven't figured it out yet. And if you'll just keep loving and you'll just keep sharing, sooner or later you're going to wear them down and you're going to break through and they're going to find Jesus. Luke chapter 10, verse 16 is an interesting word and, and I want you to hear this closely. The one who hears you hears me, Jesus speaking. And the one who rejects you rejects me, Jesus speaking. And the one who rejects me, Jesus speaking, rejects him, that is God the Father, who sent me, Jesus speaking. So when they're rejecting you, they're not rejecting you. They're rejecting him. And the last time I checked, he always wins. His love will overcome a multitude of sin. Which brings me to the third truth. We will be equipped to say what is needed at the right moment. I was with somebody recently in a restaurant waitress came and brought us our food and I just reached over and because I knew her I knew I could get away with it I took her by the hand and I said hey we're going to pray for our meal and I would love to have the opportunity to invite you to pray with us and if you can't pray with us is there a special need that we could just remember for you as we pray now I know this girl well and, and she let go of my hand and she came over and she put her arm around me and she said, I'd rather pray with you and here's what I need you to pray specifically about. 
And about, along with praying God's blessing over the meal, we, we just prayed for her need. She gave me a big hug and she went on about her business and, and, and the person I was with looked at me and they said, I could never do that. You make that look so easy. Where did you learn that? How do you do that? And I, and I shared with them this, this little verse of scripture. It's, it's really kind of interesting. Don't be anxious how you're to speak or what you're to say or because what you say is gonna be given to you at that hour for it's not you who speak, but the spirit, your father speaking through you. I would like to take credit for all of those great evangelistic moments that happened in my life. I would like to say I am so good and have been educated so well that, that I just know how to do this. Can I tell you that as your pastor, I still shake in my boots every time an opportunity presents itself? Scares me to death every single time because I recognize I'm handling the issues of eternity. And if that doesn't shake you up, something, something ought to shake you up. My first church, uh, the man who built my pulpit put a sign on my pulpit uh, up at the top that, that, that he wanted me to make sure that I saw every Sunday morning. And so he put it in big block letters and it said, be careful today, what you say will affect eternity for someone. <sighs> Changes the whole order of what I do. Because right now, someone could be making a decision that goes the wrong way. What Jesus is trying to teach us is that in those moments when we actually go to make, to baptize, to teach, when we actually seek to lead others into a personal relationship with him, when we actually do what he's called us to do as the sent ones, he gives us what we need to get it done. Now, if you don't believe me, let me invite you to think about Moses for just a minute. Moses is out on the backside of the desert and he has this incredible experience at a burning bush. And God says to Moses, you're gonna go set my people free. And I, I pretty well have it figured out what's going through Moses' mind. Just think about it for just a moment. He says, you know, the last time I left home, I killed somebody. And I've been running now for 40 years. And though things may have changed back there, the stories never end. And I'm pretty certain that they know that I'm the guy that did it. And you're asking me to go back and face the lions. I, I, I'm just not really sure I'm, I'm up for that. I, I'm thinking that Moses is saying, you know, God, there has to be a better way. Surely there's still somebody back in Egypt who could handle this much better than I. And, and what happens as you begin reading in, in Exodus chapter four is, is Moses begins sharing this litany of excuses why he can't, why he won't, and why he will not be involved in the plan and purpose of God for his life. But what's interesting is every objection that he brings up, God counters with a response. You know what? You can say that, but guess what? I'm gonna trump that, and, and this is what I'm gonna give you to make it happen. It is an amazing story. And when you get down all the way to chapter 4 verse 12 uh, this is what it says now Moses has just said God I'm slow of, slow of speech and I'm not real good at speaking and I can't really get my words straightened out and, and, and I am not the one you want to go to Pharaoh and say set my people free you just don't want I'll mess it up and then notice what the Lord says in verse 12 of Exodus chapter 4 he says now therefore go and I will be with your mouth and I will teach you what you shall speak Blew that excuse all to pieces for him and for us. You see, the reality is this. When we accept the challenge to go and we realize that he is sending us, even into places that may not be the most hospitable with people who may not be the no, most nice. He's gonna give us the words that we need to say. And when we dare to speak them, he'll receive the glory 
and he'll draw people to himself. Now, I don't know what that all says to you, but I'll tell you what it says to me. I am without excuse. It's that simple. Now, now I know what you're still thinking. Pastor, you've been trained though. You've got degree upon degree upon degree. You, you know how to do this. And there is a certain sense that I would confess to you, you're right. I, I've spent 40 years of my life learning how to do this. Now I teach others how to do this. But just because I do it doesn't mean it's easy. Just because it's happening in my world on an almost daily basis doesn't mean it's something I'm totally comfortable with. Because I'm dealing with issues of eternity every time I open my mouth for Jesus. And so are you. And in those moments, he says, I'll be with your mouth. And I'll teach you what you should speak. So hear these words once again from Romans chapter 10. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. How then will they call on him in whom they've not believed? How are they to believe in him whom they've never heard? How are they to hear without someone preaching or telling them? How are they to preach unless they're sent? As it's written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the good news. Notice now verse 17. So faith comes with hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. You and I are sent to share the good news. And so I close with this reminder. We exist to know Christ and to make him known. Nothing more, nothing less. Father, help us. To be more than hearers only, but doers also of your word. To seek in our own lives to know you in a vital, vibrant, passionate way. To go into all the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all of the things that you've commanded us. And then, Lord, as we try to figure out what that means, remind us that we are sent. And in the face of what can often be difficult and contrary people, you give us the words that we need to say when we need to say them that men and women, boys and girls might come to faith in you. That's why we're here. Help us to live it out. In the name of Christ, I pray. And all God's people said, amen. Thanks for worshiping with us this morning. Have an incredible time in Sunday school. See you back tonight. God bless.